Uh, it is an extreme pleasure to be here this evening at this important school. We have had many good friends come through here. Elizabeth and Don and I met in Berkeley, California, and we have quite a few. The Christian family is very large and very close. And of course, Dr. Costa is known to us as well, and we appreciate his leadership in South America. And my, my good friends, professors from Gordon-Conwell, uh, Aida and Bill Spencer, uh, who have been working on our academic journal for 10 years now, are here as well. And my good friend Karen and Flockamine, we are so honored to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, I have taken this photograph in Istanbul, Istanbul in Turkey. This is uh, the ancient Sunday school classes of the early church. And it celebrates the two resurrection accounts in the Bible, the two recreation accounts in the Bible. Can you see this at all? Can we turn down the, the, the lights, uh, shut the lights, just a, for one moment? Ah, this is good. OK. So in the scripture, we have two creation accounts. Adam and Eve, we are, Adam and Eve are created in God's image. And recreated, men and women are recreated in Christ. <clears throat> and these murals are called the Anastasia, or hallowing the gates of hell. And they say in one picture what I will say in 35 minutes that we are men and women born in the image of God for shared rule and care as God's representatives in this world. And we are born again in Jesus and once again endowed with power and authority side by side in advancing the kingdom in Christ's image. And these murals are all over the ancient world. And so it's exciting for me to have an opportunity to talk about our identity as Christians, created in God's image and remade in the image of Christ. And that is our theme this evening. So, right? thank you, Elizabeth, for doing these slides in Spanish for me. <laughs> OK, uh, that's good. Do you want to turn the lights back up? Thank you. From Genesis to Revelation, identity as God's people is related to these themes, created in God's image and recreated in the image of Christ. And from Genesis to Revelation, identity and service in God's, as God's people is not a result of our materiality, our birth. I'm Lebanese and French. Uh, my husband, he is Brazilian and American, American and Brazilian. It is not our nationality, our materiality, our gender or our class that gives us identity, although that is our human inclination. But in truth, the invisible world, the spiritual world, and the teachings of scripture tell us that our identity, who we really are, is that we are created in God's image, and every human being ever born has infinite worth and value because they are made in God's image. And if you are created in God's image, you are given abilities and responsibility to represent God uh, as an image bearer. And if you, uh, as Christians, we believe that we have, we enter we go through a second birth. We are reborn of the spirit. And in Jesus, that is our truest identity. And it was this identity that very much changed uh, the ancient world. Uh, the Christians were always bumping up against uh, the class and cultural restrictions related to materiality, birth order, gender, ethnicity and class. But as we look at scripture, 
from Genesis to Revelation, we find the most astonishing people held positions of leadership. Right? Even people outside the covenant community, outside Israel, often showed greater faith than those of God's chosen people. And the biblical record illustrates how these unlikely people rose to positions of significant and extraordinary leadership, continually transcending our expectations related to tribe and class and gender. What mattered was responsiveness to God's initiative. That marked the people of faith. And this is so much so for women that it is nearly impossible to find one woman in the Bible who was continually submissive to the men in their lives. And they were constantly defying the patriarchy of this broken world. I've looked for her and she's not there. What matters is not male rule and patriarchy, but responsiveness to God's spirit. And unless we are acquainted with the gender expectations of the ancient world, it is easy to overlook scripture's challenge to patriarchy. And so our goal this evening is to notice two inseparable events in scripture. How being shapes purpose. What theologians call ontology. Who we are in our truest being, our identity, shapes our purpose. Now, the best place to find this understanding this foundation of human identity is in the early chapters of Genesis. If you want to understand gender and identity from a biblical perspective, the early chapters are the best place to start. Because here we learn that a perfect world must include men and women called to lead together as God's representatives. The only not good in a perfect world was Adam's aloneness. And God viewed Adam's aloneness as the only deficiency in a world without sin. And it's God who addresses this problem by creating woman woman he, he introduces before she's created as etzer. Etzer is, comes from two Hebrew words, to be strong and to rescue. That is who she is. Etzer, the Hebrew word etzer, appears 21 times in the Old Testament, most often for God's rescue of Israel. We remember this passage in Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes up into the hills, the Columbia and the Medellin hills, where my rescue comes from the maker of heaven and earth. This is the etzer that Eve is parallel to in the sense that she's a strong rescue for Adam. Now, woman's help through history, through the eyes of patriarchy, her help has always been viewed as inferior, weak, subordinate, ancillary. But this is not the teachings of scripture. Now, <clears throat> Adam, when he sees Eve for the very first time, recognizes her and celebrates her. You were bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. We're of the same stuff. If you are like me, you hear and see books published by Christians that talk about the differences between men and women. Men are from Mars. Women are from Venus. That is not what's happening in scripture. 
Our churches are often lived in pink and blue realities. That is not what's happening here in Genesis. Right? Scripture emphasizes not the differences ontologically of women and men, but their commonness, their oneness. Eve comes from Adam's body, so she shares a physical substance, and she shares a metaphysical substance, a spiritual substance, because she's created in God's image like Adam. And for this reason, together they represent God. Both Adam and Eve are given shared authority to care for the world, to rule over it together, and to be fruitful. The only authority Adam and Eve have is over the animals in the earth, not each other. So in Genesis 1.26, we see God said, let us make man, let us make human beings in our image, in our likeness, so they together may rule. Being and rule. They're created in God's image for shared rule. So here we see the relationship between ontology, being created in God's image, and caring for the world. Right? This idea is repeated again. And when the scripture repeats itself, it's because something important is happening. In Genesis 1, 27 through 28, the text repeats itself. So God created human beings in his image. In his image, God created them. And he blessed them. And he said, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish. Right? The first creation account suggests that to be created in God's image imparts a divine commission. We call this the divine mandate, to care for the world as God's representatives. The second creation account offers some further information, clarity on the shared role of man and woman. In Genesis 2, 7, the Lord formed the earthling, Adam, the man, out of the dust and breathed into his nostrils and took this earthling, this Adam, this man, and put him in the garden to work it. But the job required another image bearer, the woman. And God recognizes this. It's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper for him. So what happens next? Adam hears it's not good that he should be alone, and he's waiting for his etzer, his strong help. In, instead, he gets the animals, and he names them one by one. This, he, among them, he cannot find a suitable help. And this is to stress the importance of Eve. The animals lack one thing. What do they lack? The animals are not created in God's image. He can't find his etzer, his co-image bearer among the animals. So he's put to sleep, and Eve is formed out of his side as a partner. And what's the first thing he says when he sees Eve? I love your hair. <laughs> <laughs> He says, at last, it's one of the great songs of the Bible. And since I'm Lebanese and Semitic too, we sing all of our great songs. We sing our prayers. It's a great song. At last, at last, the animals weren't doing it for me. But you do. You are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. It's, an, it's an, a deep celebration that his task is now uh, he can complete it beside a co-ruler, Eve. And this oneness of body and spirit, this oneness of completing the divine commission, this oneness of purpose growing out of a shared substance is emphasized again in Genesis 2, where the mutuality of marriage it reads like this, for this reason, a man will leave his
his father and mother and be united to his wife and they become one flesh. Now, this was written in a deep patriarchal culture where in the Semitic tribes, women leave their families and are united to their husband's tribe. And they're isolated and easily abused. But that is not the teaching of scripture. This is an affront to the patriarchy of the culture in which the scriptures come from. In this culture, we hear, and it's so, anthropologists tell us this is such um, radical social stuff, that we are, man leaves his father, leaves his tribe, and is joined to his wife, and they become one flesh. Uh, and so the harmony and the mutuality and the oneness of image bearers embarking on the divine commission, one flesh in marriage, not cleaving to a patriarchal clan, but cleaving to one another, is one of the most beautiful stories from antiquity. A uh, true story, a historical event, but so beautiful and so powerful. And unfortunately, the oneness of the human family, the mutuality between man and, and woman, does not last. It does not last. Sadly, this harmony of one flesh of substance and the shared rule is ruptured by sin, by rebellion against God. Sin distorts our relationship with God. Sin distorts our relationship with ourselves and with each other and with the earth. Uh, I, I once read that sin disrupts uh, our ego, our, our perception of who we are in this world. And patriarchy, male rule, is a consequence of sin. It, it distorts male power over women. And hear this, hear this. It distorts our, our ability to recognize the real identity of women, the real God-given identity of women by subordinating them and holding male rule as a biblical ideal, which the church has done for centuries, we distort who they are in Christ. Their identity is blurred. We don't recognize it. And this happens in a million ways every day. And it happens in tragic ways. Because as I stand here before you, 200 million girls are missing from the planet. The, uh, advent of the web and trafficking of young girls, many from this country, and the brothels that are set up, the selection of boys over girls in one child policy countries, has made it possible for us to use technology to further male rule and domination and to, to eliminate 200 million. It's the largest holocaust in all of human history. And not many people are talking. In fact, I have a little experiment. When I sit next to people on airplanes, I say, do you know 200 million girls are missing? No, and everyone says, no, I didn't know that. Oh, and by the way, and they go on to another talk. No, no one seems to care. Well, we hear the bad news that begins here in, in our rebellion against God, <clears throat> that sin has ruptured our relationships with God. And these horrible consequences follow. But male rule is one significant consequence. But in Genesis 3, we also hear some good news. We hear some good news. We learn that God will not abandon us to our own horrible choices, but that through a woman, a savior will be born. And this Christ will crush evil forever. And this is the good news, that God's mercy and grace endures. And through a woman, uh, we will have our Savior Jesus. Through Mary and the Holy Spirit, born of a woman, without the help of a man, Mary and the Holy Spirit, Christ is born. And through Jesus, we receive redemption and reconciliation with God and one another. In Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit to resist the power of sin to oppose prejudice and domination of person over person, man over woman. And in Genesis 3, it tells us the bad news, the consequences of sin. We will always be fighting these consequences 
but we have now the power to oppose them and dismantle them. We have the goodness of our next creation account. We wreck the first one, and in Jesus, we get a second chance. We have a, re a chance for re being recreated in the image of our humble Savior, Jesus. Now, despite the fact that now Adam and Eve are banished from the gardens, the flashing swords keep them out, and they journey, the, journey, the human journey is an arduous one, a, a difficult one. And despite being banished from a perfect world, and the daily encounter with patriarchy, disease, death, and, and work that is difficult, work that is difficult, uh, we see in the text, in the Bible, that women continue to have this ability to be strong rescuers, though they live very much in a broken, as we all do, sinful world uh, where patriarchy is the dominant force. So this strong rescue of women continues. Uh, and it's just astonishing when you think about it. The places where women are especially strong, strong rescuers, etzers, is in their prophetic voice in history. They were never made priests, and there's lots of reasons or arguments why this was the case, not to confuse uh, the people of God with the cultic priests. I think um, Phil Payne's dad raises that point in one of his books, uh, Barton Payne. And, um, but actually, the great leaders in the Old Testament, and you can ask Dr. Costa about this, were the prophets, right? Because the priests spoke on behalf of the people to God, but it was the prophets who spoke on behalf of God to the people. They were the leaders of leaders. They were the prophetic voice. And women were abundantly evident among these prophets. So here are just a few. There are many others. We could talk about uh, Miriam uh, was the first person called a prophet in the Old Testament. And her leadership of God's people is celebrated by the fact that Israel would not travel without her. Deborah was a prophet. She was a judge. She's called the mother of Israel. She was the highest ranking uh, leader in Israel in her day. And we have uh, Huldah, very important prophet, who during the reign of Josiah, the book of the law was discovered, and his committee goes to Huldah for advice instead of Zephaniah and Jeremiah, both prophets at the time. Her prophetic leadership leads to a great revival in Israel's history, one of the greatest, and it would last for generations. We have other prophets in scripture, uh, Noadiah, Esther, and Abigail. Noadiah is mentioned by name and is the only prophet mentioned in Nehemiah. Esther and Abigail are called prophets in the rabbinic literature. But we see the strong rescue in some unlikely women. For example, Jael. How come no one names their daughter Jael? <laughs> my middle name. <laughs> Jael uh, was, she received the general of an army at war with Israel in her tent. Oh, only generals met with under other generals and he uh, expected to take perhaps Israeli, Israeli women home as trophies of war. He expected to win his war against Israel and did not expect to become a trophy himself at the hands of a woman. Also, we have Sarah. Uh, she's listed here. Sarah is a strong etzer, a strong rescue. And when God promised that she and Abraham would bear children, she took matters into her own hands. She gave Hagar to her husband, and he follows her lead. God tells Abraham in Genesis 21, 12, assuring him that, Israel, that his he would have children, and they would lead Israel. And God tells 
Abraham to listen to Sarah. Well, like Sarah, we have Rebecca, who orchestrated an inheritance for her younger son, Jacob. Rachel gives Bilhal and Leah to her husband, Jacob, who's called the father of Israel. And though Jacob is called father of Israel, Rachel's making all these key decisions, always making key decisions, using what influence they had in the patriarchal world, demonstrating their creational identity as strong rescue. You begin to wonder if men are making any of these decisions because the women are orchestrating constantly. Tamar is another great example. She uses cunning and deceiving to preserve the bloodline of her tribe. She, despite trickery, Judah admits that she is more righteous than he, illustrating again her identity as an etzer. We have uh, Zipporah, uh, the wife of Moses, who circumcises their son, performing a priestly function. And the women who uh, challenge Moses to give women land rights. And he succumbs. He agrees. This is so important to women who are working for land rights around the world, where women are not allowed to own property to this day. We even find women who are strong rescuers of God's people in the Egyptian midwives who disobey their king in order that the Hebrew babies may live. And the strong rescue of Rahab, who we heard about this Sunday in church. Rahab, uh, she sent the spies away to safety only after negotiating with them. She was in charge of the negotiations and lets them down outside the city wall after they agree to rescue and include her family in the people of God because she saw what God was doing. Well, we have Esther and Ruth, uh, also mentioned in the Old Testament. We take this for granted, but we have two books from antiquity named after women, Esther and Ruth. This is astonishing. And these women are celebrated in defying the patriarchy of their culture. Esther approaches her husband in public to in challenge his leadership in some way. He could have had her killed. But she did this because she knew God had called her to such a time as this. And in the same way, Ruth defies the, she, she pursues and has initiative with Boaz and, and, and leads, again, the people of Israel into a safe, sheltered uh, relationship with their kinsman redeemer. And despite the honor-shame codes of the Semitic culture and tribe, Esther is praised publicly for defying and bringing shame to her husband. And Ruth initiates marital overtures as the women in the Song of Songs initiate romance with men. And their strength and their initiative is honored in scripture, though culturally it would not have been considered acceptable. So these are just a few examples of how countercultural these women were in following God. And in the person of Christ, this becomes full blown. In the person of Christ, we recognize and acknowledge the strong rescue of women, which Christ just accepts as if it were the air he breathes. He is so comfortable with embracing and welcoming women. He's constantly challenging the patriarchy of his culture. In women, or in Christ, women are equal heirs of this new kingdom project. And he welcomes them and includes them and sanctions their authority just as Adam and Eve uh, were welcomed and called to a divine commission in Eden. So Jesus speaks unselfconsciously to women. He holds the longest conversation with a woman and a woman who's outside the tribe of Israel. This would be the Samaritan woman. Longest re conversation recorded in the New Testament between Jesus and a human being. Now, he is um, bold about meeting with her in broad daylight. And the disciples are ashamed 
And it's very important to watch wherever the disciples are upset because something important, something countercultural is happening here. Okay. And Jesus says to the woman who cries out to him, Blessed is the mother who nursed you and raised you and gave birth to you. And Jesus said, Blessed rather are those who obey the word of God. A woman's value and identity is not in her cultural roles, as wonderful as they are, but in responding to God's initiative. And this is the standard for the New Covenant people. Women are daughters of Abraham, a phrase first used by Jesus to recognize their full inclusion in the New Covenant. And if we think about his conversation here, celebrated in this mural in the middle, uh, with the woman at the well of Sychar, the longest conversation recorded in history, uh, Jesus is breaking quite a few cultural uh, norms in, in spending this time with her. Right? She's a Samaritan, so she's outside the tribe of Israel, and he's just a woman, and by revealing himself to her as Messiah, the Samaritans wanted a Messiah as badly as the Jews. And by, by telling her everything uh, he knew about her, exposing his uh, knowledge, his intimate knowledge of her, he enlists her as an evangelist. And she goes off to her people and says, I met someone who knew all about me. Could he be the Messiah? She leaves her jar. And she dashes to tell people who she met. But there is more. There are, there are two anointing stories in the New Testament, I believe. And these are, again, occasions in which the disciples are annoyed by Jesus' welcome and embrace of women. This one occurs at the Last Supper I have here in Matthew 26. Uh, Jesus is... This woman has an expensive alabaster jar and, uh, with gorgeous perfume in it, and she breaks it and pours it on Jesus, anointing Jesus for his death and burial. It was the most uh, in incredible anointing in all of history. She was anointing the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords for the most important work a king would ever take on and that was to, be, to reconcile us to God. It was a priestly anointing because it was the priests who anointed the kings of Israel. But this anointing comes from a woman. And, and she's not a, a, a Levite properly circumcised. She's a woman who recognizes who Jesus is and what he must do to be the king of glory. And her leadership and service make clear that she's a daughter of Abraham and an heir to the promise now fulfilled that in Christ there is neither Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. And the disciples are so angry about this. But Christians ever since have celebrated her leadership. Interestingly, it was women who were the first at the tomb, Mary Magdalene. And she was. Uh, she, her faithfulness is rewarded because she meets the risen Lord. And he says to her, Mary, go and tell my disciples that I'm going to my father, your father. And she rushes to the disciples who are closed behind locked doors. And they don't believe her. Do you know who I've seen? I've seen the risen Lord. And moments later, Jesus appears with them and commissions the whole crew, right? Another commissioning. Uh, on the first day of the new world. And Tom Wright has a wonderful book about this, if you want to pick that up. Well, with Paul, this entire New Kingdom project of men and women sharing authority and leadership continues. But with Paul, we have a theological explanation for the deeds and actions we have from Christ. Paul synthesizes and provides a wonderful Old Testament, New Testament understanding of the person of Christ. And it is magnificent, and it's elaborated throughout his epistles, especially Romans, where he spends great detail telling us what being recreated in Christ means, especially in 
Romans 5 and 8, we learn that, uh, that Christ was as the second Adam. And the second Adam fulfilled all that the first, the first Adam could not. And the second Adam, um, Jesus, uh, is one who welcomes the human family into uh, this covenant in which there is neither Jew or Greek, slave or free. And you find Paul working beside slaves and Greeks and women who have positions of leadership as apostles and deacons and teachers and house church leaders. Right? And so this great groundswell of diverse Christians, Christianos, the ancient word for the Christians, the Christianos, who, who join together in their rebirth in Christ. And so this is the second creation account. It doesn't matter what your materiality is. The ancient baptismal fonts, there's a wonderful book all about ancient baptismal fonts. They were shaped like wombs. So you go into the water, you're a dead person, you're crucified with Christ, you rise out of the womb reborn, and you are clothed in Christ. You are now perfected in, through Jesus' sacrifice. That is your new identity. That is your new materiality. Not your skin color, not your ethnicity, not your gender, not your class, if you are a slave. Your real, eternal identity is your rebirth and your clothing, being clothed in Christ. That's who you are. And that's who you will forever be, regardless, because this world in its present form is passing away. And the real, eternal work of the Holy Spirit in you will last forever. Hallelujah. And so Paul summarizes his larger theological work in Galatians 3.28. That's, uh, oh, now it's in Spanish. As many of you were baptized. Baptism is not insignificant. It's a declaration of, it's an, a, a public declaration that you may look at me and you might see a Lebanese woman, but I am remade in Jesus. I was outside the tribe of Israel, but I am included in this beautiful promise God made to Abraham in the very beginning, despite my, because my materiality is not strong enough to keep me from the cross and the fruit of the cross, and neither is yours. And that's the good news, and that's something worth dying for. So this is um, important stuff that we recognize our oneness in Jesus and what was accomplished on Calvary and its consequences every day in our life. And for this reason, baptism replaces circumcision as the outward symbol of our intimate relationship with God. Those who are baptized in Christ are clothed in Christ, and your former life is gone, whatever you were, whoever, whatever status you may or may not have had. And so in Romans 28, 29, Paul tells us that those who are called of Christ are being conformed day by day in the Holy Spirit to the image of Christ, to his nature, his habits, his, his priorities. We're being recreated in the image of Christ. And this is the second creation account that is so important. It overcomes everything in this world. The second recreation account in Romans 5, chapter 5 and chapter 8, 1 Corinthians 15, Galatians and Colossians, shows us that in as much as Christ rules victorious over sin and death, we who are united in Christ share in the victories of Calvary. If we share in the victories of Calvary, we are agents of Christ, equipped by the Holy Spirit with gifts for service. And to have a spiritual gift, if it's teaching or helps or administration, whatever your spiritual gift may be, and these do not come in pink or blue. Uh, oops, we'll get to it. Those spiritual gifts are, are, are accompanied by spiritual power. And for this reason, uh, Paul and Jesus continually placed the values of the new kingdom ahead of our cultural standards. Uh, 
And so Paul is continually living out these new kingdom standards. That is why Paul tells Philemon to receive Onesimus, his slave, as a brother. That's the new kingdom value. He might be your slave, but in the Lord, he's your brother. And we know that, that uh, Onesimus goes on to become Bishop of Ephesus. So they live this out. In the same way, Paul tells husbands and wives to share authority with one another in this slide. The only place authority is ever mentioned in the Bible is here relative to marriage, where Paul tells wives and husbands to share authority because the husband has authority over the wife's body and the wife has authority over the husband's body. It's shared authority. Likewise, in Ephesians 5, Paul places the burden of sacrificial love on the shoulders of husbands. He says, asking them to love their husbands as they love their own bodies. This is a very radical request of first century husbands. Anthropologists tell us it's feminist. It's very unlike anything from the ancient world. Paul tells husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church, denying their own bodies if necessary. This was radical stuff in the ancient world. Paul asks husbands to give their lives for their spouse, a complete reframing of gender and authority. The slaves are free. Onesimus is freed. And husbands are to sacrifice for their love. Their, their, their spouses. This did not happen in the ancient world. Love was not really part of marriage, per se. But Paul is saying you must love your wife like your own body. So if she's cold, you're cold. She's hungry, you're hungry. She's sad, you're sad. It's the oneness of Genesis, the one flesh of Genesis. It's a beautiful thing. And this is where it starts with Paul. Paul is certain that God is building a new covenant people, Jesus as the head and all of us united as the body of Christ. So he's not reluctant to call Junia an apostle, one who encountered the Lord personally. In fact, she's prominent among the apostles. He's not uh, hesitant to celebrate Priscilla, who was a great teacher. She corrected a great evangelist in the Bible, Apollos, or Lydia and Chloe, Nymphia and Athia, who were house church leaders. This is the new wine of Jesus, and it will require a new wineskin. With slaves and women, the materiality of their life is not relevant. What's relevant is their newness of life in Christ. Christ's kingdom, spiritual authority, is a birthright. It's given to individuals not to rule or dominate over one another, but to serve each other, because a spiritual gift is a gift for service. And the three places where the spiritual gifts are mentioned by Paul in Ephesians, Romans, and Corinthians, we have gifts of service, and we, we can name them, but you know what they are, and we find women who served in all of these places. And yet, this is the mainstream of the biblical teachings on identity and purpose. Re created in the image of God, recreated in Christ for shared leadership and authority. And yet the church continually goes to this text to limit the leadership of women. Apart from it being reborn in Christ, gifted by the Holy Spirit, Christians are placed in positions of leadership according to their character. This is a big, um, project for Paul. He doesn't want Christians who have bad character to be in positions of significant leadership. And I believe he wrote 1 Timothy 2 to say that, it's, that there was a particular problem among the women leaders in the church in Ephesus. They were domineering. They were grasping uh, power and authority to domineer and probably teach false teaching, which is one of the major problems that inspired Paul's personal letter to Timothy. 
But if you look at some of the ways in which this text is translated, excuse me, these ancient texts, the Vulgate, which we'll talk about in a minute, translate the word not to have authority, but it's to domineer. Uh, in the Bible, um, this particular passage from the Geneva Bible from the 16th century talks about uh, usurping authority. And again, in the King James from the 17th century, to usurp authority. And again, the New English Bible, 1961, is to domineer. This verb that Paul selects in 1 Timothy 2 is an unusual verb. It's only used once in the New Testament, and our Bibles don't really have it so well as these ancient, earlier texts speak of this word. And so I just want to point out that Paul is limiting their authority because of their character. And if you look at all the places where leadership in the New Testament is addressed, character is a major concern, obviously. We don't like leaders who have uh, short tempers or leaders who are indulgent in alcohol or who are not self-controlled. These are problems for leaders, and this is what Paul is talking about. And interestingly, the fruit of the Spirit uh, is another way of saying uh, these are the people who exhibit the fruit of the Spirit are the people who should be teaching. Okay, so it's a spiritual gift in its character that qualify anyone for leadership. Um, now, it's interesting because I've heard so many sermons on elders being the husband of one wife. Oh, so they must be male. No, how about putting the emphasis on one wife? Because in the ancient world, uh, husbands often had more than one wife. Just, you know, the point is, is they must be temperate and holy. Well, to follow the teachings of scripture, we might select our leaders, deacons, pastors, elders, and teachers from people who best reflect the fruit of the spirit, regardless of their gender. And so throughout church history, and I've been asked just to touch briefly on some examples, throughout church history, there are astonishing examples of women who did great, offered great leadership in a patriarchal world. And I'm just going to touch on three people from three eras. So, uh, and it wasn't, it's so astonishing to me that we simply don't know much about their leadership. But in the early church, Paula and Jerome in the top right corner, and if you look at the murals, you can find so many examples of their leadership. They were so well known in places like Turkey, Asia Minor. Paula was an amazing linguist. And beside Jerome, a church father, they produced the, the Latin Vulgate Bible. Uh, and Bible scholars tell us it was the most important Bible translation in all of history. It's the most important Bible translation in all of history. All the other Bibles stand on its shoulders. And the person behind this project was mostly Paula. She uh, had this oh, amazing linguistic ability. She could speak Hebrew, though she was Roman without a Latin accent, and she was a woman of enormous wealth. And she bought the ancient manuscripts uh, in Palestine, sat down with Jerome, and translated these. And the practice of doing these in monasteries that she built uh, continues in many places. He wasn't that interested in this project. It was Paula's project. And after she dies, he dies relatively soon because she was his great mentor and, and partner. We have uh, Apollyana. She's a deacon in the church in Alexandria. She was incredibly well known in her day. She led so many people to Christ. Alexandria was a city of great intellectual, intellectuals. They had the great library that was there. And there was probably a Christian theological school annexed to it in some way. And this great woman, Apollonia, in fact, it was Sandy who taught me how to say her name correctly. <laughs> uh, she uh, was martyred, and after her death, they built a church in her honor in Rome. Now, she was martyred because she had enormous influence in her culture as a Christian leader. And we have Macrina, who was the older sister of two great uh, church uh, fathers, Basil and Gregory, who were responsible for the Nicene Creed uh, with others. 
<laughs> uh, but Macrina, their older sister, was a great philosopher. She tried to teach her brothers, who weren't always humble, that the goal of philosophy is love, is love. Though she was wealthy, wealthy beyond years, she created a, a commune, a Christian commune in Turkey, where everybody lived in, on common ground. These are leaders, their prayers are preserved on the web, and, and their work is preserved, their writings are preserved, and it's just wonderful to read. Um, you can read about them. And uh, these are th three, I just picked three leaders from the Middle Ages for us to consider these called Christian mystics. Uh, these were women who, what we mean by mystic is they were intimate with Christ. They were united to Christ in incredible intimacy. And they were great, they were great reformers. They didn't simply sit in a place um, of prayer, but they were out working on various projects. Trez of Avila, uh, was a great uh, church reformer. She was part of the Counter-Reformation in uh, Spain. We went to see her home not so long ago uh, in, in an old Roman city. She uh, was always in trouble with the church authority because she wanted to return the church to its roots of simplicity and prayer. The church had become greedy and uh, corrupt and she was part of this project to keep the church uh, in love with Jesus. And she was very in love with Jesus. Uh, she wrote a book called um, The Spiritual Castle, was it? Interior Castle, that's it. It was one of, it's just the most amazing uh, works you could possibly hope to read. We have Catherine of Siena, who was active during the plagues that swept through Italy. She was part of a very small walled city on a hill. You could see how the plague would spread quickly. It was a time of enormous corruption. There were two popes. Everybody was vying for power. This was an amazing etzer. She would write letters to the pope, and she would start out her letters, Babo, Daddy, Daddy Pope, Babo, you have become so corrupt you were sucking the blood out of the veins of the church. And the church has become pale and anemic. It would be better for your soul if you gave up your authority and let others become healthy too. <laughs> now, she was fearless. And she went to Rome. Uh, when, I think she went to Avignon. Uh, probably closer. I don't know. Maybe she went to Avignon. She, she approached one of the popes, uh, and she condemned the greed and corruption of the church. And the pope took off his sandals, they say, and walked humbly through the city square. And the cardinals looked at each other and said, she is far more prophetic than we are, and this is our job. So she was an incredible church leader. And then we have Catherine, uh, sorry, Hildegard von Bingen, she was an abbess of a double monastery. So she was responsible for the monks on one side and the girls on the other, women on the other. Her leadership, she was a great, I saw her churches on the Rhine uh, last summer, and they had an enormous library. She was a voracious reader, a great scholar. She was a musician and a doctor. She classified all of these plants and figured out what would bring healing to people. And she discovered the power of music to bring life to ill people. So if you have someone in your family who's very ill, try a lot of gospel music, sing, do a lot of singing. She believed this would restore health to people. But popes and cardinals and bishops constantly sought her advice because she was holy. She was wise. And these are some great leaders, women leaders, etzers from the Middle Ages. And this continues during the Protestant Reformation. You have Catherine von Bora, who's the wife of Dr. Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King, wrong King, Martin Luther, what am I thinking of? Tired. Uh, Martin Luther, she was a very courageous nun, fought for the Reformation. I don't think we realize how close they came to death so often. Courageous woman. And 
she and her husband, Martin Luther, so enjoyed marriage after being uh, celibate monks and nuns for so long. Had a great family life together. You have Jean d'Albray. Where's Karen? Jean d'Albray. Karen, you're going to go right through their country in Basque, in Galicia, when you walk the Camino. Jean uh, is the daughter of Margrethe. They were queens of Navarre, where there was a great ref reform happening in France. This was the great uh, protection they offered the Huguenots in France. They translated the Bible into French, or sorry, into the Basque language. The Basque people did not have a Bible since the fifth century. And thanks to these great women, they were able to provide a Bible for the French, for the Basque. Eventually, they, uh, Jean's son, Henri, uh, uh, created a law for religious freedom in France so the Protestants and the Catholics could live without um, conflict, political conflict. And we have Lady Jane, who was Queen of England, part of the Great Reformation in England, along with Anne Askew, when they were tried for their Protestant views, it, it showed their intelligence, which were recorded by their interrogator. Their minds were brilliant. Lady Jane, queen for a few months, uh, had so memorized the Bible in Greek. She read Latin. She read many modern languages and was, a, was able to articulate the Protestant faith so beautifully, uh, as did Anna Skew, who was the only woman tortured in the Tower of London. And moving to Phoebe Palmer, who was the mother of the holiness movement, again, shaping theological thought in the church uh, for it, uh, that lasts to this day, the holiness movement. My favorite period of history that I've been asked to speak about is uh, the modern, uh, the evangelical movement, the early evangelical movement. And here we have an amazing flowering of egalitarian thought. These were Christians who embraced uh, gospel and social action as all part of evangelism. They had a very high view of the Bible. They were biblicists of the highest order. They had a strong view of the cross. They were crucicentrists. And they preached on Galatians 2.20 more than any other group of Christians in history. And Galatians 2.20 uh, is... Uh, I have been crucified with Christ, and in Christ, it is not me who lives, it is Christ who lives. And this view of the cross, their identity was in Jesus, their identity was Christ. They became these amazing reformers. I don't see a slave, I see a Christian united to Christ. I don't see a woman, I see a person united to the cross. In this person, Christ lives. The Christ is their identity. The Christ is their power. And that's who I work with. And so these leaders went on to advance suffrage and abolition. They, they actually shifted the density of Christian faith from the West to places widely scattered in the Americas and Africa and Asia. They were reformers. And women outnumbered men two to one on the mission field because they had such a high view of the cross. And uh, we have to always remember their systematic theological approach in all of this. So this is the end. Mm -hmm. uh, again, celebrating the creation accounts in history, in the scriptures, uh, male and female created in God's image, male and female. Uh, called to share dominion. Uh, unfortunately, because of sin, a Savior was sent to suffer on our behalf, to die for us, and we are remade in the image of Christ, where we are clothed in Christ, and our identity is in Christ, not our materiality.